Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the vir Virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Towards Zero Unplanned Downtime of Medical Imaging Systems Using Big Data. My name is Sue LeClaire, Director of Marketing at Vertica, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Joining me is Mauro Barbieri, Lead Architect of Analytics at Philips. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click Submit. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we'll answer as many questions as we're able to during that time. Any questions that we don't get to, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Alternatively, you can also visit the Vertica forums to post your questions there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, a reminder that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. So let's get started. Mauro, over to you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. So medical imaging systems, such as MRI scanners, interventional guided therapy machines, CT scanners, DXR system, they need to provide hospitals optimal clinical performance, but also predictable cost of ownership. So clinicians understand the need for maintenance of these devices, but they just want to be non-intrusive and scheduled. And whenever there is a problem with the system, the hospital suspects Philips services to resolve it fast and at the first interaction with them. In this presentation, you will see how we are using big data to increase the uptime of our medical imaging systems. I'm sure you have heard of the company uh, Philips. Philips is a company that was founded 129 years ago, in, actually in 1891, in Eindhoven, in the Netherlands, and it started by manufacturing uh, light bulbs and other electrical products. The two brothers, Gerard and Anton, uh, they took an investment from their father, Frederick, and they set up to manufacture and sell light bulbs. And as you may know, a, a key technology for making light bulbs is, uh, was glass and vacuum. So when you're good at making glass products and, and, and vacuum and light bulbs, then there is an easy step to start making radio valves, like they did, but also X-ray tubes. So Philips actually entered very early the market of medical imaging and healthcare technology. And this is what our, is at our core as a company and is also our future. So uh, healthcare, uh, I mean, we are in a situation now in which everybody recognizes the importance of it. And, and we see uh, uh, incredible trends in a transition from uh, what we call volume-based healthcare to value-based, where, where the clinical outcomes are driving improvements in the healthcare domain, where it's not enough to respond to healthcare challenges, but we need to be involved in preventing and maintaining the, the, the population wellness. And from a situation in which we episodically uh, are in touch with healthcare, we need to continuously monitor and continuously take care of populations. And from healthcare facilities and, and technology available to a few elected and rich countries, we want to make healthcare accessible to everybody throughout the world. And this, of course, has, uh, has poses incredible challenges. And this is why we are transforming the Philips to become a healthcare technology leader. So from Philips has been a concern realizing and active in many, sec in many sectors and, and realizing all kinds of technologies, we've been focusing on healthcare and we have been transitioning from creating and selling products to making solutions to address these healthcare challenges and from selling boxes to creating long-term relationships with our customers. Um, so if you have known the Philips brand from, from shavers, from, from televisions and light bulbs, you probably uh, now also recognize the, uh, the involvement of Philips in the healthcare domain, in diagnostic imaging, 
in ultrasound, in image guided therapy and systems, in digital pathology, uh, non invasive ventilation, as well as patient monitoring, intensive care, telemedicine, but also radiology, cardiology, and oncology informatics. Philips has become a powerhouse of healthcare technology. To give you an idea of this, uh, these are the numbers for uh, from 2019. About almost 20 billion sales, 4% comparable sales growth with respect to the previous year, and about 10% of the sales are reinvested in R&D. This is also shown in the number of patent rights. Last year we filed more than 1,000 patents in, in the healthcare domain. And the company is about 80,000 employees uh, active globally in uh, over 100 countries. So let me focus now on the type of product uh, that are uh, at, um, in the scope of this presentation. This is a Philips Magnetic Resonance Imaging Scanner, also called Ingenia uh, 3.0 Tesla. It's an incredible machine, apart from being very beautiful, <laughs> as you can see. It's a, it's a very powerful technology. It can make high-resolution images of the human body without harmful radiation. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex machine. First of all, it's massive. It weighs uh, 4,600 kilograms, and uh, it has a superconducting magnet cooled with liquid helium at minus 269 degrees Celsius. And it's actually... Um, full of software, millions and millions of lines of code, and it's occupied three rooms. What you see in this picture, the examination room, uh, but there is also a, a, a technical room, which is full of, 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 of equipment, of custom hardware, and a machinery that is needed to operate this complex device. This is another system. It's an interventional uh, guided therapy system where the x-ray is used during interventions with the patient on the table. You see on the left what we call a C-arm, a robotic arm that moves and can uh, take uh, images of the patient while it's been operated. It's used for cardiology intervention, neuro uh, neurological intervention, cardiovascular intervention. There's a table that moves uh, in very complex ways and uh, it, again it occupies two rooms this room that we see here, and, but also a room full of cabinets and, and hardware and computers. This is another, uh, yeah, another characteristic of this machine is that it has to operate, uh, uh, it, has, it is used during uh, medical interventions, and, and so it has to interact with all kinds of other equipment. This is another system. It's a, it's a, it's a computer tomography uh, scanner icon, which is a unique. It is unique due to its uh, uh, special detection technology. It has an image resolution up to 0 0.5 millimeters, uh, making 1,000 by 1,000 pixel images. And um, it is also, also a complex machine. Uh, this is a, um, the picture of the inside of a, a comparable device, not really an icon, but it has a a gantry rotating, uh, which weighs two and a half ton. So it's a combination of X-ray tube on top, high voltage generators to power the X-ray tube, and an array of detectors to create the images. And this rotates at 220 right per minute, making 50 frames per second to make 3D reconstruction of the of the body. So a lot of technology, complex technology. And this technology is made for this situation. We make it for clinicians who are busy saving people's lives. And of course, they want optimal clinical performance. They want the best technology to treat the patients. But they also want predictable cost of ownership. They want predictable system operations. They want their clinical schedules not interrupted. So. They understand these machines are complex, full of technology, and these machines may have, may require maintenance, may require software updates, sometimes may even fail and require uh, some parts, hardware parts to be replaced, but they don't want to have it unplanned. They don't want to have unplanned downtime. They would hate send, having to send patients home and to have to reschedule visits. So they understand maintenance, they just want to have it scheduled, predictable, and non-intrusive. So already, 
a number of years ago, we started a transition from what we call the reactive maintenance services of these devices to proactive. So let me show you what we mean with this. Normally, uh, if a system has an issue, a system on the field, a traditional reactive uh, workflow would be that this, the customer calls a call center, reports the problem, uh, the company servicing the device would dispatch a field service engineer, the field service engineer would go on site, do troubleshooting, literally smell, uh, listen to, to, to noise, uh, watch for lights, for, for blinking LEDs or other unusual issues, and would uh, troubleshoot the issue, find the root cause, and perhaps decide that a, a, a spare part needs to be replaced. So he would order a spare part, the part would have to be delivered at the site either immediately or the engineer would, would need to come back another day when the part is available, perform the repair, that means uh, replacing the part, do all the needed tests and validations, and finally release the system for clinical use. So as you can see, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of steps and also handover of information from uh, one to, between different people, between different organizations even. Wouldn't it be better to actually keep monitoring the install base, keep observing the machine, and actually, based on the information collected, detect or predict even when an issue is, is going to happen, and then instead of reacting to a customer calling, proactively approach the customer, scheduling preventive service, and therefore avoid the problem. So this is actually what we call proactive service. And this is what we have been transitioning to uh, using big data. And big data is just one ingredient. In fact, uh, there are more uh, things that are needed. The devices themselves that need to be designed for reliability and predictability. If the device is a black box, does not communicate to the outside world its status, if it does not transmit data, then of course it is not possible to um, observe and therefore predict issues. Uh, this of course requires a remote service infrastructure or an IoT infrastructure as it is called nowadays, the possibility to connect uh, the medical device with uh, a data center, an enterprise infrastructure, collect the data and perform the remote troubleshooting and the predictions. Also the right processes and the right organization is to be in place because an organization that is uh, you know, waiting for a customer to call and then has a, a number of field service engineers available and a certain amount of um, spare parts in stock is a different organization from an organization that actually is continuously observing the install base and is scheduling actions to prevent issues. And uh, another pillar is knowledge management. So in order to realize predictive models and to have predictive service action, it's important to manage knowledge about failure modes, about maintenance procedures uh, very well, to have it standardized and digitalized and available. And last but not least, of course, the predictive models themselves. So we talked about transmitting data from the install base from the medical device to an enterprise infrastructure that would analyze the data and generate predictions. That's predictive models are exactly the last ingredient that is needed. So this is not uh, something that I'm, you know, I'm telling to you for the first time. It's actually um, a strategic intent of Philips where we aim for zero unplanned downtime and we market it that way. We also, it's not a secret that we do it by using, to, by using big data. And uh, of course, there could be uh, other methods to, to achieving uh, the same goal. But we started using big data already, yeah, well, quite, quite many years ago. And one of the reasons is that our medical devices already are uh, wired to collect lots of data about their functioning. So they collect events, error logs. There are sensor connecting, sensor data. And to give you an idea, uh, for example, just as an order of magnitude of size of the data, the one MRI scanner 
can log more than 1 million events per day, hundreds of thousands of sensor readings, and tens of thousands of many other data elements. Um, so this is truly um, big data. On the other hand, this data was, was actually not designed for predictive maintenance. You have to think a medical device of this type of is, uh, stays in the field for about 10 years. Uh, some a little bit longer, some a little bit shorter. Uh, so these devices have been designed 10 years ago. And not necessarily during the design, and not all components were, desi were designed with predictive maintenance in mind, with IoT. And with the latest technology at that time, you know, uh, perhaps we were not so forward-looking at the time. So the actual the key challenge is taking the data, which is already available, which is already logged by the medical devices, integrating it, and creating predictive models. And um, if we dive a little bit more into the research challenges, this is one of the challenges, how to integrate diverse data sources, especially how to automate the costly process of data provision and cleaning. But also, once you have the data, let's say, how to create these models that can predict failures and the degradation of performance of a single medical device. Once you have these models and alerts, another challenge is how to automatically recommend service actions based on the probabilistic information of these possible failures. And um, once you have the insights, see even if you can recommend action, still recommending an action should be done with the uh, goal of planning maintenance for generating value. That means balancing costs and benefits, uh, preventing unplanned downtimes without, of course, scheduling uh, and, uh, unnecessary interventions, because every intervention, of course, is a disruption for the clinical schedule. And there are many more applications that can be thought of, such as the optimal management of spare parts supplies. So how did we approach this problem? Our approach was to collect into one database, Vertica, uh, a large amount of historical data. First of all, historical data coming from the medical devices. So event logs, parameter value, system configuration, sensor readings, all the data that we had at our disposal, that in the same database together with records of failures, maintenance records, service work orders, part replacement, contracts. So basically the evidence of failures. And once you have data from the medical devices and data from the failures in the same database, it becomes possible to correlate event logs, errors, signals, sensor readings with records of failures and records of part replacements and maintenance operations. And we did that also with a specific approach. So we, cre we, we created integrated teams, and every integrated team had three figures, not necessarily three people. There were actually multiple people. But there was at least one business owner from the service organization. And this business owner is the person who knows what is relevant, which use cases are relevant to solve for a particular type of product, for a particular market, what basically is generating value or is worthwhile tackling as an organization. Then we had data scientists. Data scientists are the ones who actually can manipulate data. They can write the queries, they can write the models, they know about statistics, they can create visualization, and they are uh, the ones who really manipulate the data. Last but not least, very important is subject matter experts. Subject matter experts are the people who know the failure modes, who know about the functioning of the medical devices. Perhaps they have even designed, they either come from the design side, or they come from the service innovation side, or even from the field. People who have been servicing the machines in real life for many, many years, so they are familiar with the failure modes, but also familiar with the type of data that is logged and the processes and how actually the systems behave, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you allow me, in, in the wild, in the, in the field. So the combination of these three figures was a key because data scientists alone, just uh, statisticians basically, or people who, who can all do machine learning, um, they are not very effective because the data is too complicated. The failure modes are too complex. So they would spend a huge amount of time just trying to figure out the data 
or perhaps they will spend their time in tackling things that are useless because a subject matter expert knows much quicker which data points are useful, which phenomenon can be found in the data or are probably not found. So the combination of subject matter experts and data scientists is very powerful. And together, guided by a business owner, we could tackle the most useful use cases first. So these teams set up to work and they developed three things mainly. First of all, they develop insights on the failure modes. So by looking at the data and analyzing uh, information about what happened in the field, they find out exactly how things fail uh, in, in a very uh, pragmatic and quantitative way. Also, they, of course, set up to develop pre the predictive model with associated alerts and service actions. And the predictive model is just not, uh, an, an alert is just not, not a flag. It's, it's just not a flag, only a flag that um, turns on like a, like a traffic light, you know. <laughs> but it's much more than that. It's uh, such an alert is uh, to be interpreted and used by a highly skilled and trained engineer for example, in a, in, a, in a call center, who needs to evaluate that alert and plan a service action. Service action may involve the ordering and replacement of an expensive part. It may involve calling up a customer a hospital and scheduling a period of downtime, downtime to replace a part. So it has an impact on a clinical practice, could have an impact. So it is important that the alert is uh, coupled with sufficient evidence and information for such a highly skilled train engineer to plan the service session efficiently. So it's a, it's, it, it's a lot of work in terms of preparing data, preparing visualizations, and making sure that all the information is represented correctly and in a compact form. Additionally, these teams develop, uh, get insight into the failure modes, and so they can provide input to the R&D organization to improve the products. So. To summarize this graphically, we took a lot of div uh, historical data from coming from the medical devices, from the history, but also data from relational databases where the service work orders were, the part replacement, the contract information. We integrated it and we set up to do the data analytics. From there, we don't have value yet. Only value starts appearing when we use the insights of data analytics, the model, on live data. When we process live data with the module, we can generate alerts, and the alerts can be used to plan the maintenance, and the maintenance, therefore, the planned maintenance replaces replacing downtime is creating value. To give you an idea of the, of the type of, uh, I, I cannot show you the details of these modules, uh, of these predictive models, but to give you an idea, this is just a picture of some of the components of our medical devices for which we have models for which we have, uh, for which we cover failure modes. Hard disks, uh, clinical grade monitoring, uh, mo monitors, uh, X-ray tubes, and so forth. This is for um, MRI machines, a lot of custom hardware and other type of amplifiers and, and electronics. The alerts are then displayed in a, in a dashboard, what we call the remote monitoring dashboard. We have a team of remote monitoring engineers that basically surveils the install base, uh, looks at this dashboard, picks up these alerts, and um, uh, an alert, as I said before, is not just one, one, one flag. It contains a lot of information about the, uh, the failure and about the medical device. And the remote monitor engineer basically they pick up these alerts, they, they review them, and they create cases for the markets organization to handle. So they see an alert coming in, they create a case so that a particular uh, call center in, um, in some country uh, can call the customer and schedule and make an appointment to schedule a service action. Or it can add, add a preventive action to the, the, the schedule of a field service engineer who is already supposed to go to visit the customer, for example. This is a picture, an high-level picture of the overall data processing architecture. Uh, on the bottom, we have the install base. The install base is formed by all our medical devices that are connected to our Philips Remote Service Network. 
data is uh, transmitted in a in a secure and and in a secure way to our enterprise infrastructure where we have a so called data lake which is basically um an archive where we store the data as it comes from uh from the customers it is scrubbed and protected from there uh we have a processes etl extract transform and load that in parallel analyze this information parse all these files and all this data and extract relevant parameters all this re the reason is that the the data coming from the medical device is very uh, verbose and in legacy formats sometimes in binary formats in 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 strange legacy uh, structures and therefore we parse it and we we structure it and we make it um, basically usable by the data science team and the results are are stored in a in a vertical cluster in a data warehouse uh, in the same data warehouse where we also store uh, information from other enterprise systems from all kinds of databases from SQL Microsoft SQL Server Teradata SAP from Salesforce applications so the enterprise IT system also are um, they are connected to Vertica the data is inserted into Vertica and then from Vertica the data is pulled by our predictive models which are Python and R scripts that run on our proprietary environment health suite insights from this proprietary environment we generate the alerts which are then used by the remote monitoring application this is not the only application this is the case of remote monitoring we also have applications for what you call remote service so whenever we cannot prevent or predict we cannot predict an issue from happening or we cannot prevent an issue from happening and we we need to react on a customer call then we can still use the data to very quickly troubleshoot the system find the the root cause and advise for the best service action Additionally, um, there are uh, reliability dashboards because all this data can also be used to uh, perform reliability studies and improve the design of the medical devices and is used by uh, R&D and the access is with all kinds of tools. So Vertica gives the flexibility to connect with JDBC uh, to connect uh, dashboards using Power BI to create dashboards using ClickView or just simply to use R and Python directly to perform uh, analytics. So little summary of the of the size of the data for the for the monument we have integrated about uh, 500 terabytes more than 300 tables about 30 trillion data points uh, more than 80 different data sources for our complete connected install base including our customer relation management system SAP uh, we also have connected um, we have integrated data from, uh, from 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 the factory from repair shops this is very useful because having information from the factory allows to characterize components and devices when they are new when they are still not used so we can uh, model degradation excuse me and predict failures much better also we have many years of historical data and of course 24 7 live feeds so to get all this going um, we uh, we have chosen very simple designs from the very beginning this was developed it back the first uh, system in 2015 at that time we went from scratch to production eight months and um, it's also a very stable system uh, to do achieve that we apply what we call exhaustive error handling uh, when you process a I think most of people attending this conference probably know when you are dealing with big data uh, you have probably you face all kind of corner cases you thought it would never happen but just because of the sheer volume of the data you find all kind of strange things and that's what you need to take care of if you want to have a stable a stable platform a stable data pipeline also another characteristic is that uh, we need to handle uh, live data but also we able to we need to be able to reprocess large historical data sets because insights into the data uh, are getting generated all the time by the team that is using the data and very often they uh, find not only defects but also they have change requests for new data to be uh, extracted to be extracted in a different way to be aggregated in a different way so basically the, the platform is continuously crunching data 
Also, components have built-in monitoring capabilities, uh, transparency, transparency builds trust by showing how the platform behaves. People actually trust that they are having all the data which is available. Or if they don't see the data or if something is not functioning, they can see why and where the processing has stopped. A very important point is documentation of data sources. Every data point has so-called data provenance uh, fields. Uh, that is not only the medical device where it comes from uh, with all this identifier, but also uh, from which file, from which uh, moment in time, from which row, from which byte offset the data point comes. Uh, this allows to identify, and, and not only that, that's the, but also when this data point was created by whom, by whom meaning which version of the platform and of the ETL created the data point. This allows to identify issues and also to fix only the subset of when, when an issue is identified and fixed, it's possible then to fix only a subset of the data that is impacted by that issue. Again, this creates trust in the data, which is essential for this type of applications. Um, we actually have uh, different uh, environments in our analytics solution. One that we call data science environment is more or less what I've shown so far, uh, where uh, it is deployed in our Philips um, private cloud, but also can be deployed in, in, in public cloud, such as Amazon. It contains years of historical data. It, is, it allows interactive data exploration, uh, human queries. Therefore, it has a highly variable load. It is used for the training of machine learning algorithms, and this design has been such that we uh, it, it, it is for allowing rapid prototyping and for large data volumes. Another environment is the so-called production environment, where we actually score the models with live data for the generation of the alerts. So this environment does not require years of data, just months because a model to make a prediction does not need necessarily years of data, but maybe some model even a couple of weeks, or a few months, three months, six months, depending on the uh, type of data on the failure which has been predicted. And this has highly optimized queries because the applications are stable. It on, they only change when we deploy new models or new versions of the models. And it is designed and optimized for low latency, high throughput, and reliability. It's no human intervention no human queries, and of course there are development and staging environments. Um, one of the characteristics, another characteristic of all this work is uh, what we call data-driven service innovation. Uh, in, in all this work, we use uh, uh, data in every step of the process. The first, the business case creation. So basically, uh, some people ask, how did you manage to find the uh, unlocked investment to create such a platform and to work on it for years? You know, how did you start? Basically, we started with a business case. And the business case, again, for that, we use data. <laughs> of course, you need to start somewhere. You need to have some data. But basically, you can use data to make a quantitative analysis of the current situation and also make a, a, as accurate as possible estimate quantitative or value creation. If you have that, basically, uh, it's, it's, um, you can justify the investments and you can start building. Next to that, data is used to uh, decide where to focus your efforts. In this case, we decided to uh, focus on uh, the use cases that had the maximum estimated business impact. With business impact, we mean here customer value as well as value for the company. So we want to reduce unplanned downtime. We want to give value to our customers. But it would be uh, not sustainable if for creating value we would start replacing you know, parts without any consideration for the cost of it. So it needs to be sustainable. Uh, also then we use data to analyze the failure modes, to actually do digging into the data, understanding how things fail uh, for visualization and to do reliability analysis. And of course, then data is a key to do feature engineering for the development of the predictive models, for training the models, and for doing the validation with historical data. So data is all over the place. And last but not least, again, these models, this architecture generates new data about the alerts and about the 
how good the alerts are and how well they can predict failures, how much downtime is being saved, how many issues have been prevented. So this is also data that needs to be analyzed and provides insights on the performance of these uh, of this models and can be used to improve the models. And last but not least, once you have performance of the models, you can use data to uh, to quantify as much as possible the value which is created. And in this way, you go back to the first step. You made a business value. You you create the first a business case with estimates. Can you can you actually show that you are creating value? And the more you can um, have this feedback loop closed and quantified, the better it is for having more and more impact. Among the the key elements that are needed for realizing this, I want to mention one about data uh, documentation. This is a practice that we started already six years ago. It's proven to be very valuable. We document always how data is extracted and how it is stored in, in data model documents. Data model documents specify how data goes from one place to the other. In this case, from uh, device logs, for example, to a table in Vertica. And it includes things such as the definition of duplicates, queries to check for duplicates, and of course, the logical design of the table, but also the physical design of the table, and the rationale. Next to it, there is a data dictionary that explains for each column in the data model from a subject matter expert ex perspective what that means, such as uh, its definition and meaning is if it's, a, if it's a measurement, the unit of measure and the range or if it's a, um, some sort of, um, of label, the expected values, or whether a value is, is raw or, or calculated. This is essential for maximizing the value of the data, for allowing people to use the data. Last but not least, also an ETL design document. It explains how the transformation has happened from the source to the destination, including, very important, the failure handling strategy. For example, when you cannot parse part of a file, should you load only what you can parse or drop the entire file completely? So import uh, best effort or do all or nothing? Or how to uh, populate records for which there is no value? What are the default values? And you know how, to, how the data is normalized or transformed? And also how to avoid duplicates. This, again, is very important to provide to the users of the data a full picture of of the data itself. And this is not just um, this is a formal process. The documents are reviewed and, and, and approved by all the stakeholders, including the subject matter experts, and also the, 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 the data scientists from a, a function that we have started called Data Architect. So to, um, this is something I, I want to give about, oh yeah, and of course the, the, the documents are available to the end users of the data. And we even have links to the document from the data warehouse. So if you are, if you get access to the database and you are doing your research and you see a table or a view, you think it could be that could be interesting. That looks like something I could use for my research. Well, the data itself has a link to the document. So from the database, while you're exploring data, you can retrieve a link to a place where the document is available. This is just a, um, a quick summary of some of the of the results that I'm allowed to share at this moment. Uh, this is about uh, image guided therapy uh, using our remote service infrastructure for remotely connected system with the right contracts. Uh, we can uh, achieve. We have been, um, we have reduced downtime by 14 percent. More than one out of three of cases are resolved remotely without an engineer having to go on site. 82% is a first time right fix rate. That means that the, the issue is fixed either remotely or if a visit at the site is needed, that visit, only one visit is needed. So at that moment, the engineer will go to the site with the right part and fix this straight away. And this results on average on 135 hours more operational availability per year. And this, therefore, the ability to treat more patients for the same costs. I'd like to conclude with uh, 
citing some nice testimonials from some of our customers, showing that the value that we've created is really high impact. And this concludes my presentation. Thanks for your attention so far. Thank you, Mauro. Um, very interesting. And we've got a number of questions that we that have come in, so let's get to them. Um, the first one, how many devices has Philips connected worldwide, and how do you determine which related sensor data workloads get analyzed with Vertica? Okay, so there's actually two two questions. So the the the, the first question: How many devices uh, are connected worldwide? Well, actually, I'm not allowed to tell you the precise number of connected devices worldwide. But what I can tell is that we are in, in the order of tens of thousands of uh, of devices, and um, of all types, actually. And um, how would, do we determine which related sensor uh, gets analyzed with Vertica? Well. Um, a little bit how I said in the in the presentation is a combination of two approaches. It's a data-driven approach and a knowledge-driven approach. So a knowledge-driven approach because we make maximum use of our knowledge of the failure modes and the behavior of the medical devices and of their components to select what we think are promising data points and, and promising features. However, uh, from that moment on, data science kicks in, and it's actually data science is used to look at the actual data and come up with uh, quantitative information of what is really happening. So it could be that an expert is convinced that the particular uh, range of value of a sensor are indicative of a particular failure, and it turns out that maybe it was too optimistic, or the other way around, that in practice there are many other situation, situation he was not aware of that could happen, so thanks to the data, then we, you know, get a better understanding of the phenomenon, and we get a better modeling. I hope that answers uh, the question. Yeah, um, we have another question. Uh, do you have plans to perform any analytics at the edge? Yeah, that's a good question. So I can't disclose our plans on, on this right now, but edge, dev edge devices are certainly uh, one of the options we look at to help our customers uh, towards uh, zero plan downtime. Not only that, but also to facilitate the integration of our solution with the existing and future uh, hospital IT infrastructure. I mean, we're talking about advanced security, uh, privacy, and uh, guarantee that the data is always safe and remains uh, patient data and clinical data uh, remains uh, does not go outside the, the the premises of the hospital, of course. While we want to enhance uh, our functionality and provide more value with our services, yeah. So, edge definitely a very interesting area of innovation. Okay, another question: What are the most helpful Vertica features that you rely on? I would say uh, the first that comes to mind to me at this moment is ease of integration. Basically, with Vertica, we will be able to load any data source in, in a very easy way. Uh, and also, Vertica can be interfaced very easily with all type of clients ad, and application. And this, of course, is not unique to Vertica. Nevertheless, the added value is that this is coupled with an incredible speed, incredible speed for loading and for querying. So it's basically a very versatile tool uh, to innovate fast for data science, because basically we do not, uh, and uh, another thing is multiple projections, advanced encoding and compression. So this allows us to perform the optimizations only when we need it, and without having to touch applications or queries. So if we want to achieve higher performance, we basically spend a little effort on imp improving the projection, and uh, then we can achieve um, very often uh, dramatic increases in performance. Another feature is uh, EU mode. Uh, that's great for uh, for cloud for cloud deployment. Okay. Uh, another question: What is the number one lesson learned that you can share? I think that I would. My advice would be: document, control your entire data pipeline, end to end. Create positive feedback loops. So. I hear that um, 
what I hear often is that enterprises, I mean, Philips is one of them that are not digitally native. I mean, Philips is 129 years old as a company, so you can imagine the, the legacy that we have. We were not, you know, we are not born with the web, uh, like web companies are with, with, you know, with everything online and uh, everything digital. So enterprises that are not digitally native, sometimes they struggle to innovate in big data or into do, to do data-driven innovation because, you know, then data is not available or is in silos. Data is controlled by different parts of the, organi of, of the organization with different processes. There is not a, a super strong um, enterprise IT system providing all the data, uh, you know, for everybody with APIs. So my advice is to, to for the very beginning, aim at create, creating as soon as possible an end-to-end -end solution from data creation to consumption that creates value for all the stakeholders of the data pipeline. It is important that everyone in the data pipeline, from the producer of the data to the, to the consumers, basically, in all the data pipeline, everybody gets a piece of the value, a piece of the cake. When the value is proven to all stakeholders, everyone will naturally contribute to keep the data pipeline running and to keep the, the quality of the data high. Hope that's uh, <laughs> understood as a Thank you. advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, and in the area of machine learning, what types of innovations do you plan to adopt to help with your data pipeline? So in the area of machine learning, we're looking at things like um, automatically detecting the deterioration of models to trigger improvement action, as well as connecting to it active learning uh, again, focused at improving the accuracy of our predictive models. So active learning is when uh, the uh, additional uh, human intervention labeling of uh, difficult cases is triggered. So the machine learning, the classifier may not be able to, uh, you know, classify correctly all the time. And instead of just randomly picking up some cases for a human to review, you, you want the the costly humans to only review the most valuable cases from a machine learning point of view, the ones that would contribute the most in improving the classifier. Another area is uh, is deep learning, and who's not working on it, I mean, uh, but, but also uh, uh, applications of more generic anomaly detection algorithms. So the challenge of anomaly detection is that we are not only interested in finding anomalies, um, but also in recommended proper service actions. Because without a proper service action, an alert generated because of an anomaly in the data uh, loses most of its value. So this is where right. I think we... Yeah. No, go ahead. No, this, that's it. Thanks. Uh. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's all the time that we have today for questions. Um, I want to thank the audience for attending Marl's presentation and also for your questions. If you weren't able to, if we weren't able to answer your question today, I'd ask, um, let, well, let you know that we'll respond via email. And again, our engineers will be at the Vertica, on the Vertica forums awaiting your other questions. Um, it would help us greatly if you could give us some feedback and rate this session before you sign off. Um, your ratings will help us guide us as when we're looking at content to provide for the next Vertica BDC. Also note that a replay of today's event and a PDF copy of the slides will be available on demand. Um, we'll let you know when that'll be by email, hopefully later this week. And of course, we invite you to share the content with your colleagues. Again, thank you for your participation today. This includes this breakout session and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.